Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast the Leader Legion, we're going to have a great conversation today because we're going to talk uh, we're about how to talk about race at work. Uh, with Kelly McDonald. Okay, so Kelly McDonald was born and raised in a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was one of four kids and was the second oldest in the lineup. Two parents, two brothers, one sister, and two boxer dogs made for a lively household, to say the least. The suburb in which Kelly grew up was one in which everyone was largely the same, white and middle class. In college, she realized the world was not all white and middle class and she made friends with people of many different backgrounds. The insights garnered from people with different perspectives shaped her interest in marketing and selling to different market segments. After graduating from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she worked at a global ad agency prior to becoming a professional speaker. She has been a professional speaker for 20 years and has written four best-selling books on diversity, leadership, marketing, and the customer experience. She was the first professional speaker to teach people the value of diversity in business and how to talk about a topic that few know how to do effectively and competently. Kelly McDonald is considered one of the nation's top experts in diversity and inclusion, leadership, marketing, and the customer experience and consumer trends. Her client experience includes brands such as Toyota, State Farm, NASA, Kimberly Clark, Nike, Harley Davidson, Great Clips, Miller Beer, and Sherwin-Williams. She has been featured on CNBC, in Forbes, Inc. Magazine, Business Week, CEO World, Fast Company, and more. She's the author of four best-selling books, and her newest, It's Time to Talk About Race at Work, Every Leader's Guide to Making Progress on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is one of the top best-selling business books in the U.S. Kelly lives in Denver when she's not on the road speaking, and she enjoys boxing, yes, boxing, not kickboxing, uh, and shopping for high heels. Uh, she's also learning how to play the cello. Kelly McDonald, are you ready to help us get over the hump? I am. I am. Thanks so much, Jim. And hi, everybody. Um, I'm glad you're here. And I am really looking forward to this conversation. The fact is, is as I was going through your book, I'm like, uh, th- this is, and you even said earlier, we might be here for a couple hours because the topic is so diverse in itself. <laughs> And so it has so many layers, as you say. Now, don't scare the, the listeners away, you know, because we're not probably going to be here for a couple of hours, but nope. we're going to have a great conversation. <laughs> but hopefully what we're doing is uh, we're giving them the information that they need in order to go get your book and to use the tools. And we're going to talk about some of the methods that you have in there. Yep. Um, but first, I want to talk about in the introduction, you mentioned something about that we have lost our way when it comes to having sensible, constructive conversations about race. If you could kind of explain that a little bit. Yeah. And I would also lump diversity in there too, because race is, as you know, Jim, not the only way that we can be diverse, but Uh I, what my feeling is, and I think most people would agree is that, you know, as we, as we become a more polarized and divisive society with, you know, what I call sides, I mean, literally like that's almost like a war term, right? Like what side are you on? Um, And at the same time, as we've learned more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what I find is that people have become absolutely terrified of saying the right, you know, the uh, the wrong thing um, or fear of, or they fear that what they say might be taken the wrong way. And there are serious consequences for that, right? I mean, in, in many organizations, you say the wrong thing or it's taken the wrong way or whatever, you know, you're out you're out, like you lose your job. Um, Or, you know, you get branded as somebody who's not on the diversity bandwagon, or, you know, you get labeled with a horrible label, like homophobe, xenophobe, you know, misogynist, racist, sexist, or whatever. So there's a couple things going on. One is people are so afraid of saying the wrong thing that they will say nothing. And I think that is a terrible thing for business. I think in business, 
We have to be able to talk about problems and situations that are real that might be holding our business back, okay? So I'm coming at this straight from the business lane. And then I think there's the other aspect of it, which is, you know, many people feel that diversity, equity, inclusion are all concepts that have been hijacked by the far left. And if you're not far left, then you roll your eyes and you're like, okay, so, okay, let's be woke, you know, and all this. And they're just, there's a little bit of diversity fatigue in there. And there's a little bit of like, maybe this isn't for me because this is for the people who are far left. And my whole premise is I'm not talking about the left or the right. I'm not really sure I actually care how you brand yourself in that spectrum. Okay. I'm just talking about this from the center lane of business. We all have businesses to run and we have, we are business people and we are trying to be successful and do the right things. So what, what do we need to know about DEI at work, which is why it's called at work. Okay. I'm not coming at this from the standpoint of activism. I am not coming at this from the standpoint of social or racial injustice. I'm coming at this from the standpoint of this is part of the fabric of business now. So how do we do this better? And that's, you know, that's why I have that set up in the beginning, which is like, I just want people to understand that, you know, this is not a lecture from me on, you know, you need to be more woke or anything like that. It's like, I feel, I strongly feel that people have gotten the why of diversity, equity, inclusion. Businesses have done a great job of telling us why, and society's done a great job of telling us why. What everybody lacks is the how. Hmm. Nobody, nobody told us how to have these conversations. Or, you know, if I disagree with you and we're coming at it from totally different perspectives, what's the productive and constructive and professional way to, to, to move through that conversation? Like nobody taught us how. And that's where I think people get stuck because going back to my original statement, they're so afraid of saying the wrong thing that they just they don't say anything. So, well, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get into some of the do's and don'ts and things yeah. like that. Um, um, but before we get into that, I want to address the whole business issue. And in the book, you say uh, that the reality is, is that all white or mostly white businesses make less money. I'm like, what? How is that possible? It's true. Uh, and this is not, you know, conjecture on my part. This is studies and, uh, and studies and actually study after study after study shows this. Um, there's actually never been a study ever from any organization, not from a think tank, not from a university that shows that a non-diverse team outperforms a diverse team. It's, it's the opposite. Study after study shows that a diverse team outperforms non-diverse teams all the time on every kind of business metric in which we measure business success, right? So sales, profit, employee satisfaction, employee engagement, customer retention. I mean, go down the list of like everything that you could say, here's what a successful business looks like. Tick, 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 tick. Non-diverse team, or excuse me, pardon me, diverse teams outperform on every measure. And when I say diversity, I want to be very clear that it's not just about race, ethnicity, it can be age, it can be gender, it can be diversity of thought, right? So a group of engineers thinks very differently than a group of graphic designers, right? Or like I do a lot in the insurance business, the people who are in, are in insurance sales operate very differently and are wired very differently than the people who are the actuaries and the underwriters and the ones who are assessing risk, you know? And so it's like you're either risk averse or risk... Um, takers. And so when I define diversity, it's any way that you can be different from me. And a lot of businesses are waking up to that, that it's not just, okay, let's check the box of race, ethnicity, age, gender, sexuality, you know, gender ID. It's that diversity of thought. So what, what's happening is when we have, let's say, an all-white organization, and especially if it's like even more homogenous, like all-white and male and older male, right? Like I do a lot in the banking industry and I'm not trying to be mean. The banking industry is just very, very populated by older male and white executives in their fifties and sixties who have been in that industry for decades. Well, what happens is if there's nobody new around the table, who's offering a new perspective or a new uh, perspective based on background experience, then we end up defaulting to the same solutions and we never really come up with new ideas especially if you're successful, right? Because if successful companies are successful, then they go, why would we change anything? We're killing it. You know, we're just killing it over here. Like we've got the perfect model. Well, how much more successful could you be 
if you were actually considering avenues of customer per- perspectives that you lack because you're not that way, right? So that's why um, all white companies make less money than those who have diverse talent in whatever way you wanted to find that diversity. Yeah, I, th- I think when you say the diversity of thought, uh, I mean, it's almost like everything kind of stems from that. Um, so yeah, I, I remember a, a scenario where I was in a particular meeting as a provider of a service with uh, an executive vice president of a global firm. Uh, he had 80 of his direct reports in this room, and he was introducing me in regards to some of the work that I was going to be doing with the organization. Uh, and then towards the end of the meeting, I, obviously it must have been his customary practice. He would ask people if they had any thoughts, any ideas, and you know things like that. And it was crickets. 80 people in this room. And everybody's going, all good. Crickets, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and what I learned to find mm-hmm. out, you know, with time is the reason that they didn't say anything is because he was just a total jerk. I mean, anything you brought up that was not. You it down. Yeah, it was not within his line of thinking. Mm-hmm. You got beat up. And mm-hmm. so after a while, people are just like, no, I'm good. <laughs> Well, one of my, it, it's absolutely right. And one, and the diversity of thought is really important and diversity of perspective. Okay. Um, because diversity of thought can be, you know, I can have a good thought or I can have a not so good thought or whatever, but at least the thoughts are being put on the table, right? Like, what if we did this? What if we looked at it this way? What if we talked to new customer groups? What if we expanded into this kind of market? What if we made something new, you know, whatever. But one of my greatest uh, examples for diversity of perspective is Bethany Frankel and her Skinny Girl cocktails. Are you familiar with Skinny Girl, that brand? Maybe you're not. I am familiar with the brand. (laughs) Um, So, and I don't mean to be disparaging, but you're a guy and you're not exactly the target market for that, okay? But that's exactly the point of the story is, so she had this concept that maybe women would really like a good tasting, low calorie cocktail that didn't burn through 80% of their calories for the day, right? A Cosmo that has like 700 calories. And so women are very calorie conscious. And we tend to watch our weight more than men do. And it's, you know, so she pitched this concept and that's all it was, was a good tasting, low calorie cocktail called Skinny Girl. She pitched it to every major liquor company in the United States, every one of them, every one of them turned her down. Hmm. Okay. And she went ahead and forged on her own and built the brand. And two years later, which if in your life, two years goes as fast as it does in mine, it goes like that. Two years later, after launching the brand, And after selling 400 million cases of Skinny Girl, Beam, as in Jim Beam, bought her company back from her or bought it from her for $100 million, okay? The same company that they took a pass on two years earlier. So so then you ask, why, right? And what I believe happened is, and this isn't being sexist, it's just factual, Women metabolize calories differently than men. That's a fact, okay? It's just harder for us. Our bodies are meant to store calories more than men. And so it's harder for us. And all of these liquor companies were headed by men at the time, okay? So again, that's not a sexist comment. It's just factual. What I think happened is when she went in pitching, they didn't dismiss her and go, that's a stupid idea. That's a dumb idea. I think they didn't get it. I think they literally were just like, I'm not sure there's a market for that. And I promise you, if there'd been some women around the table, those women would have been like, hold up, are you kidding? There's a huge market for this, you know, as proven by the fact that 400 million cases of Skinny Girl were sold in the first two years of launch. So in my opinion, that is a failure of perspective because it's not that men, again, dismissed or like, they don't have that experience. They don't have that experience of going, I wonder if I eat this, if I'm going to pay the price on this tomorrow and I have to eat salads the rest of the week. You guys just don't think like that. Women think about it like that all the time. And so there was a real opportunity here to have something new and good in their lives, like a nice cocktail that actually wasn't revolting and that, and that fit, you know, that fit for them. And so that kind of failure of perspective is what can, or, or that kind of difference in perspective can either, you know, really help a company grow or not in the case of this. So great for Jim Beam, right. Or or great for Beam because they jumped on it and they recognized like, whoa, we need to circle back to this and get on this. And they did. And that's terrific. But again, they missed out on the first 400 million cases of product, which is a lot of product. 
Yeah. And gosh, when, when you, I mean, I, I don't want to get too sidetracked in, in what we're going down to the Let's path. Do there. I want to stick to this, but because I mean, it, like I said, it gets so deep and there's, like you say, so many layers um, that oftentimes, you know, I would dare to say, you know, even going back to that Jim Beam example um, and, and thinking about that different perspective, people have their own biases, but they oftentimes they make excuses when yes. it comes to you know, diversity and yes. inclusion and, and all of those types of things. So, you know, what are some of the common things uh, that people are doing in regards to that? Um, great question. And I think I want to just sort of frame this up as in many cases, Jim, I don't think that their excuses are conscious. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if they're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion at work, I don't think they're kind of going, hmm, here's how I'm going to get around this, right? Like I, it's not that conscious and that deliberate, but I do think they default to why we're not doing anything or why it hasn't worked or why not to actually have to focus on this. And they do it sort of like on autopilot, okay? So there's a lot of different excuses, but one of the most common ones uh, that I come across all the time is they'll say, we hire for quality, not color, Okay, so if they're, if you know an organization is going, we need to diversify our talent, and then people say, well, you know, we don't just want black or brown people or old or young people or men or women. We hire for quality, not you know a, a, a niche or whatever. the The reason that doesn't <clears throat> hold water in ninety nine point nine percent of organizations is no one can actually define what quality is, so it becomes subjective. So that's fine if you only hire for quality, but then you better darn well have an exact definition of what quality is. And everyone in that company has to know what that is. And that is the framework then on which you must evaluate candidates. And it would then be not subjective, it would be objective. And that never happens, okay? Because different hiring managers will look at somebody and say, well, I don't know if this is the most high quality candidate we can we can find. And then it's like, if you pressed on that and said, define quality. I mean, clearly you need to be qualified. So that's a quality measure, right? You have to be capable of doing the job. And, you know, perhaps another measurement would be relevant experience. It doesn't have to be exact experience, but relevant experience. But beyond that, what is quality? Okay. So that whole argument just falls apart there. Um, and same thing with culture fit. That's another excuse that we hear all the time is that our culture is work hard, play hard, you know? And so we're always looking for work hard, play hard. Like, well, first of all, define what that means. Does that mean that like you guys go out and party till 10 o'clock at night with your, you know, I mean, it's just, it's some of these like nebulous concepts that if you're actually trying to be an objective hiring manager, you know, and, and fill a position with a, the right person, where does work hard, play hard culture fit in there or whatever? And I believe that every company has its culture. So let me be perfectly clear on this. It's, it's fine to hire for culture fit, but you better, again, be extremely clear on what that culture is and that everyone in that company has to be using that as the defining measure of, uh, of culture fit. Again, that can't be subjective. And so a lot of these concepts are just a little too nebulous um, and then one of my third favorite ones is where someone will say, well, you know, we've already identified someone in our network who we're going to talk to. The problem with that one is networks are largely homogenous, right? If I say to you, you know, who do you know, Jim, you know, we're, we have an open position. Who do you know? And you go, well, there's this guy I play golf with, or there's this person I go to church with, or I know a guy, or I know, you know. You're dealing with your own network. And guess what? Your network tends to be a whole lot like you. That's not diversifying in any way. So I think we kind of default to these like uh, ruts almost, you know? And again, nobody see they're going, I refuse to be diverse. You know, it's not that. They just fall into these habits of thinking. And those habits of thinking don't get changed unless we consciously say, wait a minute. What are we looking for in this candidate? Where might we find a person with those skills, even if they don't fit anybody that we've ever hired here before? A, a really great example of, of, <laughs> of just fault, uh, defaulting to what they think is good is a friend of mine in Cincinnati. There's apparently in Cincinnati, I live in Denver, as you said. So apparently in Cincinnati, there's a 
very, very well-regarded high school. Okay. There's like a really good high school. I have no idea which one it is, but it's like the high school. And he was telling me that if his company, when they get candidates who are recent graduates from that high school or somebody, a recent graduate from college who went to their high schools or whatever, he said, when they are sitting around in their, in their office, and he freely admitted this, um, and he said, when we look at somebody and that, I'll call it high school A, the good one, and high school B is any other high school. And he said, if we have a candidate on paper who went to high school A, every single one of us automatically goes, that's the person we should hire. Look at that. He, went, he or she went to this high school. And I pushed back on him and I said, what if that person is a big jerk and they're not qualified or whatever? And the person who went to high school B is amazing and would do the job perfectly. And he goes, that's our fault. He goes, we just keep looking at that high school and going, that's the person that we want to hire. So these are the traps that people get into because they're assuming that anyone who went to that high school is amazing. And yet there might be a better qualified candidate who just didn't live in that zip code for crying out loud and went to a different high school. And if you fall into those traps, you're going to keep getting the same kind of people. Okay. And nothing changes. So I, I, I totally get, and this is one of the things that happens all the time when you start talking about the you know, theoretical aspects of a particular topic and the practical application, right? right? Um, and so when you start, you know, as they say, peeling back, you know, the layers and the onion or the, uh, yep. things like that, you start, you know, you, you started hitting these excuses and then people are like, okay, well, maybe we need to have and do a better job of some self-awareness components. And maybe we need to try to apply it, but then they fall into the traps of a lot of do's and don'ts, you know, and some of those yeah. do's and don'ts come from our upbringing, like you were saying yeah. in medicine, you know, perspective. in, in, in perspe- the, the perspectives and all that. Um, you know, and then having it change a little bit when you go to, you know, um, you know, West University of Wisconsin, Madison, but, oh, hey, by the way, I'm sure that has a very large percentage at the time when you went of white people, you know, it's a, you know, so it's like, okay, you kind of got moved into it, but I would imagine there were some do's and don'ts that you were going through. You see these do's and don'ts all the time. What are some of the things in regards to talking about this issue um, that we need to address? This is one of my favorite things to talk about because people are so horrified about the don'ts when you kind of like lay it out. And I think most people really want to do the right thing, right? So people love do's and don'ts, but within that gym, they especially love the don'ts because they don't want to do the wrong thing. And so it's like that show, What Not to Wear. They didn't call it what to wear. They called it what not to wear. And I'm like leaning in. I'm like, tell me what not to wear. I don't want to be a laughing stock. So here's some of the big don'ts. Um, don't... Um, Don't ask somebody how they got their job because doing so implies that you think that they didn't earn it somehow, that either there was tokenism and they were, you know, check the box or that they knew somebody who got them the job. You know, it's very, it's a very insulting comment. Like, how did you get your job? And so I don't believe that you can give people a don't gym without giving them the do. So don't ask somebody how you got your job, but do instead say, if you're curious, then you can say, tell me about what you were, what your prior role was and what you were doing or you know, prior to this role. Tell me about your background and your prior role. Because those are that's a legitimate question. Most of us have the jobs that we have now based on our past experience. And those are the things that qualified us for the job that we have now. And so that's the legitimate way, if you're curious about somebody's role of how they got there, as opposed to how did you get your job, which is really insulting. Okay. So that's a big don't. Um, Another one is my, one of my favorites is to say, you know, if someone has what I call an outer envelope, okay, that looks different from yours, right? Let's say they're Middle Eastern, they're Black, they're Asian, they speak with an accent, you know, whatever it might be that is different. Where are you from? And then they say, you know, New Jersey. And then you're like, no, 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 but, but where are you from from? And then they're like, New Jersey. And they're like, yeah, but like, where are you from? from? (laughs) It's like, so the reality is in doing that and saying, where are you from? And then keep drilling down, where are you from, from what they're really trying to ask is what's your lineage, right? Or something, but it's all the insulting part about that is that it's based 100% on the envelope of us. Right. So nobody ever asks me that Jim, nobody ever asks me, where are you from? And then I say, Milwaukee and they go, yeah, but where are you from, from McDonald? Is that Irish? Are you from Dublin? You know, like nobody ever asks me that. Okay. Because my envelope looks a lot like a lot of other people's envelope. All right. 
So if you are curious about somebody and their background, and again, don't do it based on color or accent and things like that. That's just pointing out some of these otherness. Um, the better way to say that is to say, tell me about yourself. And I love tell me about yourself because what people will tell you, Jim, is what they think is important. And they might say, you know, if you say, tell me about yourself, you might say, you know what? I'm, uh, I've, I've been doing this podcasting thing for like eight years now. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, it's the greatest thing I've ever done. It's really gratifying because prior to that, I was doing this. And you may or may not tell me where you're from. Maybe it's irrelevant. Maybe you're going to tell me, I, I actually was breaking the ice at a conference one time and doing a, you know, cocktail schmoozing kind of thing. And I talked to this young woman and I said, tell me about yourself. And she thought for a minute and she goes, I just moved from a condo to a condo. And I just cracked up and I was like, that's what she wanted to talk about, you know? And I was like, all right, tell me about that. And so we started a conversation about why she moved from a condo to a condo. And then that conversation, you know, went in all different kinds of directions. But the point is, if you say, tell me about yourself, people will tell you what they think is important. And sometimes it actually may reveal some things like, you know, uh, you know, I'm the first person in my family that, that went to college and this is my like second job in the, in the insurance industry. And it's awesome because my parents were, you know, from Taiwan and I was the first person who was, you know, U.S. born Taiwanese, you know, or, or but sometimes it never comes up at all because that's not what is important. So that's a that's the don't and the do. So don't say, you know, where are you from from? <laughs> um, actually, I have one more quick story. On that is because it's funny. A friend of mine is Asian. And um, so he's US born and just, I mean, but he's Asian in his background. And so he has the, his envelope has an Asian appearance and he's in uh, Tulsa. And so he was at Walmart one day and the guy ringing him up is like, you know, he's paying for his stuff. And the guy ringing him up goes, Where are you from, man? And he goes, Tulsa. And the guy goes, Yeah, yeah, but like, where are you like from, from? And he goes, Tulsa. <laughs> and the guy goes, well, you speak English really good. And my friend said, no, I speak English really well. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, it's ridiculous when, and we're laughing because it's so ridiculous and insulting, but it's just silly. It doesn't, you know. Um, and then one other big don't is, and I would just tell all of, your, all of your audience right now to eradicate these two words from your language immediately and forever. And this is also teachable. So tell your teams and everyone you know to stop saying the following two words forever, starting right now. And those words are either you people or those people. Because you people or those people is a very clear wall that you put up that says, you're not like me or you're not like the rest of us. So it's definitely putting that person in an other camp. And even when it's wrapped in a compliment, like, I just love how you people are so faith and family oriented, right? That's a nice thing to say, but you've still put it as you people. So you, again, you can't give somebody a don't without giving them a do. So let's say you're curious about somebody or their traditions or their faith or whatever it is. Don't say, what do you people eat for Hanukkah? Okay. Say instead, what's a traditional food served at Hanukkah and how does your family like to celebrate? That's how you can get to the exact same. I mean, if you're curious about food, then ask it in the right way. Don't tell them, what do you people eat for Hanukkah? Just what are the traditional foods served at Hanukkah? And, and you know, how does your family celebrate? Because that you might find that somebody says, you know what, we're Jewish, but we're just, we just don't do all that food. Uh, you know, we don't have time. And so we do this or that or something like that. Or they might say, yeah, here's all the traditional foods. And my grandma makes them every year. And, you know, but it's, it's the you people, those people. Anytime you start talking about you people or those people, what follows is going to be incredibly offensive. <laughs> well, I mean, as you're, as you're talking, I'm okay. So, so for, for me, I, I continue to try to focus in on you know, what I say, how I say it, you know, and people will just oftentimes slough it off when they don't want to think about it. I'll say, oh, that's just semantics. And I'm like, <laughs> semantics, yeah. semantics can make you trillions, you know, um, and also keep you at the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, I mean, so it's and like, it okay. Can, it can either build bridges between people or drive wedges between people, you know, right. how you make somebody feel and how you're connecting with them matters. Okay. So th then I start, I start thinking about this and, you know, there, there's, we could probably go on forever. And I think you even mentioned that you have like pages and pages when you, when you, um, you know, are teaching about this particular yeah. issue and on do's and don'ts. Um, 
Um, but a lot, but a lot of it uh, has to mean that we have to have some vulnerability in, in order to, you know, get that feedback you know, and how people are, are receiving it. And, mm-hmm. and, and here's the thing, you know, going back to your Asian example, um, you know, some, some people may be okay with that from, from, you know, and some people, you know, it will be totally offensive to. I haven't found a lot of people who are okay with that <laughs> because, because again, they feel very much like you're commenting on the color of my skin, the shape of my point. eyes, my accent or whatever. And it's like, I'm a person, just talk to me. <laughs> and and again, what I find is when you say, tell me about yourself, people will share what they think is important. And a lot of that stuff may come up there. You know, you don't have to probe because nobody ever asked me, Kelly, where are you from? And I go Milwaukee and they go, right, right. But where are you from, from? I hear that your last name is McDonald. So like, is that Scottish or Irish? And like, when did your parents and grandparents come over on the boat? You know, like nobody ever asked me that because I look like they do. That's true. Well, and, and so if you think about where we're going with this, you're like, okay, how do we get this started? And you actually have an acronym called starting. Yes, you call I do. It the starting model. So if you could kind of walk us through, you know, the acronym and the meanings and, yep. um, you know, how, how we can actually start implementing. This is for everybody. Thank you, Jim. This is for everybody, this model. And I find that people like steps, right? Because when you start talking about making progress on diversity, equity, inclusion in an organization, it's such a big topic that people are like, I don't even know where to start. You know, like, how do I get my arms around this? So my effort here is to give people a framework that is literally eight steps that is the the path forward on this. And every one of these is just a step, you know, I mean, like when you get to the bottom or the end of it, you're not like done. I don't think we're ever going to be done, which is why I call it making progress on diversity, equity, inclusion. I don't think we're ever going to be finished. You know, it's kind of like saying we're finished with technology. You know, it's like, but yeah, no, we're always making progress on technology, but we're never finished. All right? right. So the starting method is an acronym and the first, and this is for everyone, but it's especially important for leaders who lead a team and they're trying to make progress on de and in their organization. And as a leader, it's up to them to figure out what this is going to look like and how to begin. So it's especially true for your leaders. So the first thing in the S in starting is sincerity. And this is really important because if you approach this with a sincere heart and you say, we can do better and be better, okay? And this is what I think people are really latching onto is it's not, it's not like, oh, we need to populate our workforce with different colors of people. It's more, we can do better and be better. We haven't been very diverse. We know we need to change that. So we're going to start working on how to do better and be better. And it is a process. You're not going to just like knock this out in a, a year, right? But the, but the effort has to be sincere. Somebody can't be doing this because of tokenism or because, you know, the public lens is on you and how much diversity do you have? It has to be sincere. And the reason I say that this is important is I actually had a conversation with a guy at a large, 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 humongous, well-known Fortune 100 insurance company that everybody knows. And he's about a 58-year-old white guy, and he's been at the company for 25 years, and he's not a bad guy, okay? I want to just say this because this is going to make him sound bad, but he's not a bad guy. But he said to me, um, so, you know, here at the XYZ company, uh, we're doing this whole thing on DE&I, and he's kind of like, you know, and he's like, so, you know, my, my, one of my things in my performance objectives for this year is to diversify my team and my bonus depends on it. So I guess we're doing DE and I now. And he literally like did this like hand movement to me, right? I guess we're doing DE and I now. And I thought, he's not a bad guy, but this is so insincere. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with putting bonuses behind goals. That's how companies achieve goals all the time. Is like, this is so important. We're going to put money behind it. Okay. That's going to be what your focus is. There's nothing wrong with that. But to basically be approaching it as like, okay, I guess I have to diversify my team now and get behind this. It just smacks of insincerity and I wouldn't want to be on that team, you know? So sincerity. Then the second thing is the T, which is transparency. And I think transparency is really important because it's important to acknowledge where we are and where we're not. And I think the best companies and leaders will do that kind of conversation where they say, we know we're not very diverse and we need to change that. So it's going to take all of us within this department or team or company to work on this. And in doing so, we're going to be exploring a lot of different avenues. Some are going to work. Some are not going to work. 
but we need to be working on this together. We're open to ideas. And this is virgin soil for us. We've never done this before. We may make some, some mistakes, but that kind of transparency puts people at ease because they realize that they don't have to have all the answers because nobody has all the answers. And that kind of transparency makes people go, okay, all right. He just, he or she just said, we're, we're going to just take some steps in the, is, excuse me, in this direction and then assess how we're doing as we go along. That there's no fabulous blueprint for this. You know, there are clear steps that people can take, but that kind of transparency allows people to exhale because then they're the ones in the room thinking, whew, okay, I'm not the only one who doesn't know how to do this. Like we're going to do this together. Well, how do you prevent a situation where, uh, you know, if we start looking at, you know, we referenced before about the all white or mostly white, if I'm yeah. sitting there, especially if I'm a white male and I'm like, well, that means I'm out of here, right? Because they're going to get rid of me in order to replace me. Um, yep. How do you keep that fear from kicking in? I think it's, again, about transparency and addressing those things head on. The worst thing in the world that you can do is not talk about stuff, because in the absence of information, Jim, people fill their heads with the worst case scenario. Just like you said, I'm going to be out of here. I'm going to be axed, you know, just because I'm a white male or whatever. Not not true. I think the best leaders are the ones who say now. You may be wondering about this. And so let's address that head on. You may be wondering where are new people going to fit when we consider ourselves fully staffed, you know, and addressing these things and just being transparent because people can handle the truth. Even if it's difficult truth, they can handle it. What they cannot handle is the runaround or the lack of information. The lack of information can be deadly to an organization because not only do people fill their heads with the worst stuff, that's where gossip starts. That's where, did you hear? So were you in that meeting when he said this? You know, what do you think that, I mean, no, it's horrible. And so it's much better for a a leader to say, we don't have all the answers. We're gonna be learning as we go. I wanna say right now that we have an amazing team and that all we're gonna try to do here is make this team even more amazing. You know, we're not gonna be pushing people out because of the color of their skin. What we're gonna be doing is adding diverse talent to the pipeline to the pipeline so that when we have natural attrition, someone retires, someone leaves, we're poised to succeed with some qualified candidates that we've identified as people we wanna talk to. You know, That's where the transparency is. And I think when you're transparent too, it allows you to get the questions that you just asked, right? People are are gonna feel more comfortable asking the questions which are usually fear-based right? They don't ask the questions about like, this sounds awesome. How are we going to do it? You know, they're going like, well, what if, what if my, you know, what if, I mean, those are fear-based questions. And I think it's really important as a leader to, to the extent that it's possible to assuage fear, you know, and to to put people's minds at ease. And one of the things that you can do to do that is not only, um, you know, be very, very transparent or whatever, but also to use simple language. Because when you use simple language and you say, Um, here's what's going on. We can't solve this problem unless we do this. Everybody in the room hears that same simple sentence or whatever. And nobody is walking out of that meeting going, I wonder what they meant by that. Or, you know, um, what do you, you know, what do you think is really going on? When you use simple language, it fosters trust because there's nothing to hide behind. I mean, it's, it's clear. You know, so being transparent and using the simple language that gets right to it. Don't do not dance around this topic. That's what we've been doing for decades. We've been dancing around it. And now is the time to just go. We're not very diverse. Part of our business plan going forward is to make sure that we work on changing that. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's not going to happen at all if we don't start taking some steps to change things. And some of those steps look like developing a pipeline. Well, how do you develop a pipeline? By actually recruiting differently in different ways so that you can, you know, so that's the transparency part. The acknowledgement, I kind of just touched on that. The A in starting stands for acknowledgement, which is acknowledging that maybe your company or your team isn't as diverse as it could be and that you're lacking critical perspective. You know, you talk to any 55-year-old executive and then you talk to a 25-year-old executive in that same company on that same team, you're going to get totally different perspectives based on the fact that they're three decades apart in age and how they were socialized and the technology that they use and depend on or don't. And so I think just acknowledging that our differences is where our strength, our differences are where our strength is. And so different isn't bad. 
it can be uncomfortable sometimes, but it's not bad. Okay. So how do we actually make this team stronger and better? And let's acknowledge that we need to do this and that we've done a poor job of this, or maybe in the past, our efforts were pretty bad, you know, pretty lame, you know, like maybe we went out and then we hired, you know, a black woman, you know, so that we could like, and that black woman was not a good fit with the company. She actually wasn't qualified and we made a terrible hire and that's on us. You know, those kinds of acknowledgements are important. And then the next um, letter is respect. And I think one of the things that's really important for leaders to do, the intention is good, but sometimes, sometimes the respect is missing in terms of if they have a diverse team member, they will shine a light unintentionally, thoughtlessly, but not maliciously, shine a light on that diverse team member. And they're talking about, so let's say some business plan, something or whatever, and they'll go like, well, Cliff, as the gay man in the room, how do you feel about this, right? And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you know? or uh, Karen, as the woman in the room, you know, how do you feel about this? Or Carla, as the Hispanic person in the room, you know, like don't shine a spotlight on people that is completely pulling them forward just because of their diverse envelope or what, you know, the, 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 the respectful way to do this, because we do want diverse perspectives, okay? But it's not fair to just shine a laser light on one person. And basically what you're doing is, once again, I'm going to highlight you based on your envelope and the fact that you are different. So let's hear from you, different person, you know? I mean, it's just, so the way to do it is to ask the group, the whole group, which would include diverse team members, does anyone have any business or life experience that would be helpful to us or relevant to us when we think about the way forward and what we could learn from and do better. That allows that person who might be diverse to go, I have a perspective, you know, this has happened to me and I think we can do better than that or, or not. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you're not singling that person out. It's not their job to represent minorities or it's not, I mean, it's not. So if you ask the whole group, does anyone have any personal or, or business experience or, or excuse me, business or life experience, because life experience is very important. And people can then share either a, a business situation that they encountered or how a business situation made them feel, which would be a life experience. Okay. So that's the respect, which is just treating your team as a group of people who are on the same mission and asking them for their help in whatever way they think the group could benefit from this. Okay, but don't again like highlight. Okay, Cliff is the gay man. the The T in starting, so we're going through S T A R is tools. You can't tell your team that you know we need to be more diverse and then not give them any tools on 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 how to do that. So that could be training, that could be ongoing conversations about what's working, what's not. Where do you see the holes that we need to fill? What are we not doing? But you know, as we've gone through this, that you've discovered that like we're missing this piece but those ongoing conversations and the tools that people need to be successful because otherwise you're it's like saying go be successful and they're like i don't even know what that means much less alone how to do that um then the i is investment and investment can mean money a lot of co or companies and organizations are spending a lot of money on dei training and dei development and things like that it can also mean an investment of time all right. But like, I, I really feel strongly about this because, you know, we're going back to the excuses, Jim. One of the excuses I've heard is, yeah, we value diversity, but you know what? It's really expensive, you know, and we just don't have that in the budget. And, and what we, when we've looked at it, it's really expensive. Well, if you know that diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams 100% of the time, okay, you invest in every other part of your business, whether it's convenient or not. You invest in technology, you invest in marketing, you invest in professional development for your people. These are not small things. These are things that really matter that move a business forward. DE&I cannot be considered anything different than that. It is part of the fabric on an ongoing basis of how business is done today. So if you want to stay competitive and relevant in the world, DE&I needs to be part of marketing, uh, professional development, training, technology, product development, you know, all of these things that make a business and that any of these other departments or issues would be put on the table every year and be reevaluated as like, what are we doing here? So that's the investment part. And it also the investment can be time in terms of grooming people for success, which leads me to the end, which is nurturing. 
Nurturing, and I say this in the book, sounds like a gooey word. It doesn't have to be gooey. You don't have to be like, wow, Jim, you're just doing a great job, you know? Yay for you. I mean, it's not that kind of nurturing. It's making sure that people have the opportunities that will allow them to flourish. So it could be, again, additional training or whatever. But one of my best stories is I have a a, a friend who's a Black woman who is now a professor at the University of Utah. But earlier in her career, before she got into academia, she was working for a company and she was young, like in her late 20s or whatever. And her boss um, was in her 40s or something like that. And her boss called her into her office one day and her boss said, so-and-so is going to be retiring in six months. We've just learned of this. Okay. They put in for their retirement. And that means that position is going to come open in six months. And she said to my friend, do you want that job? And my friend said, yeah, of course I do. Yeah. And she said, okay, we have six months to get you ready. Here's what that means. There's going to be some committees that you're going to need to sit on. And you're going to need to put in some work and effort you know, on these committees. And in order to get on those committees, you're going to need some introductions. I'm going to have to open some doors for you with some people that you don't know, and they don't know you either. Okay. So this is the work that we have to do over the next six months. We got to make some critical introductions. We have to get you on some committees. And basically what she was saying is, I'm not going to do the work. You're going to be the one sitting on that committee doing the work, but I'm going to make it possible for you to get on that committee. Okay. And that is to me, one of the greatest stories of nurturing, because my friend didn't really have access to upper management in those kinds of ways. And if they did know who she was, they didn't know anything about her. And her her boss, who also happened to be a very nurturing mentor, made sure that she had the exposure that she needed to be considered for a committee. And then once she was on that committee, she worked her butt off doing what committees do, you know, moving the business forward. So that when the time came to be considered for that new job, she was qualified, imminently qualified. She knew the ins and outs. She knew the people that she would need to be able to access for help. And, you know, that's how business goes. So nurturing is not gooey. It's not like, good job, Johnny. <laughs> it's not that. It's, it's making sure that people have the resources and the tools and the opportunities to succeed. And then the last thing is goals. Again, like in any other part of your business, you sit down and you make goals, all right? So if you have a sales plan, what's that sales plan look like? We expect to raise, you know, to increase sales this year 7% in this product category. Okay, how are we going to do that? Where are we going to sell this product? What's it going to be priced like? Who's going to manage that territory? You know, whatever it is, we have goals. So DEI has to have a goal too. It's otherwise it's too nebulous. You can't just go, we're going to be more diverse. And I love what Levi Strauss did. Levi Strauss, Chip Berg, the CEO of Levi Strauss, actually created an open letter to all employees that then went like viral. And it's, you know, it's not a private letter, it was like put out there. And it's an absolutely great template of like, specific goals because he said Levi Strauss is a global company that is in fashion. And we like to think of ourselves as like super cool. And he's like, we've done a terrible job with diversity, even though we're in the fashion business, which should be for everybody, right? And globally, which should be for everybody. And he said, so here's what we're going to do to fix that. And he had like 19 points in this, you know, of like, here are the specific things we're going to do. 40% of the people in our pipeline are going to be diverse talent. Not necessarily even people that we hire, but 40% of the pipeline is going to be diverse, you know, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And so I think when you put a stake in the ground and you say, here's the goal, number one, you're making it real. Number two, you now know where you're tracking on that. I mean, how do you know if you're making progress on de and if you have no idea where the goalpost is? So that's the starting method. Okay, so... <laughs> So I mean, it's, <laughs> well, as I see so many layers, right. Um, and, and it's well, not an easy task, but it, it has to, there has to be the commitment behind it. And you even talk about it in the book, as far as, you know, it can't be, I just address it in the flavor of the month, kind of like that right. swinging of the arm. We're going to do this now thing. And, and in uh, fact, that's what makes people not trust it or take right. it seriously. It's, right. it's, it's harmful to your DEI efforts. But okay, so but if I'm sitting here and I have these points laid out, and you're saying 40% of our pe- people are going to be in our pipeline are going to be diverse, I mean, how do I prevent you know all of these other folks um, who may not have that same envelope, you know, start to have and have you know feelings of um, tokenism? Um, mm-hmm. Also, how do I prevent you know bias in my hiring process one way or the other? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about tokenism first. It's one of the worst things you can do. It's just absolutely acidic. It's corrosive to an organization and it's incredibly wrong to do to the person who is the token, you know, the token woman, the token religious uh, person of a different religious faith who wears, you know, a hijab or whatever it is. I mean, it's just, it's wrong. So um, in order to avoid tokenism, the number one thing I would say is hire qualified people. Okay. Hire qualified people. Um, because otherwise it is tokenism. I mean, we've all heard stories about, you know, the person who was hired because they had a different skin color or they were a different age or they were a different gender or whatever it is. And then they failed in that role, which makes the entire rest of the organization go, yeah, we tried that once and look what happened. You know, she failed or whatever. It's, it's just incredibly awful. It's just, an, and so everybody who is if somebody's not qualified, the entire organization knows that person is not qualified and you are literally setting that person up to fail. And then that person themselves knows that they're not qualified and that all eyes in the organization are on them. I mean, it's just a horrible, horrible situation to be in. And it makes the company laughable, in my opinion, absolutely laughable. And, it's, and they're, they, they come across as an insulting company because they couldn't understand how, what a wrong move this is. You know, it's just, it's, it's a joke. So in order to make sure that you avoid tokenism, it is about hiring the right people. And what that might mean is changing your recruiting and uh, your, your recruiting efforts. Where are you looking for qualified people? Because if you say, oh, we're just, we're always looking at that great high school. We always go and talk to the teachers and the guidance counselors and say, who do you have that's graduating in May? That high school might be completely homogenous and you're not going to find any diverse talent there, even though they have a good education, right? So you have to actually change the way that you recruit if you're going to find qualified people who are not like you, okay? And that might mean reaching out to community leaders and saying, you know, we know we're not very diverse. But again, that transparency, we know we're not very diverse. We're working to change that. Can you direct us to where we can find some great people to talk to so that we can start that process, okay? And be, believe me, the universal language that everyone appreciates is the language of jobs. So don't ever be afraid to talk to people about the professional opportunities that are at your organization. I mean, I have literally known um, companies that have reached out to black churches and gone and talked talk to the black pastor at a black church and said, we're not very diverse. We need to change that. You have a congregation of 300 people every week. Can you introduce us to some people who could help us try to change our, our, you know, our playbook here, you know, and that, that is not considered like, oh, I, I see you're coming to my black church just to, you know, say, do you have any black people? No, you're coming with, I have jobs. We're, this is what we do. Here's who we are. We are looking for terrific people and we do not have the diverse talent that we are, that we want and that we need. Do you have anybody we can talk to? And you never know where that kind of, you know, uh, networking can spread, but that, you know, black pastor or, you know, priest at a Hispanic church where the masses are done in, uh, you know, Spanish and things like that. They appreciate the fact that you're trying to create great jobs in the community and, you know, your local YMCA's community efforts. There's so many places that you can be talking to people. Obviously, the historically black college and colleges and universities, HBCUs. I mean, I talked to a guy. This was really kind of sad. He was like, yeah, we know we need more people of color because, you know, we're here in, you know, Charlotte, North Carolina or whatever. And a big part of the population is black and we don't really have that. And he goes, but we just can't find anybody. And I said, well, have you started talking to HBCUs? And he's like, what's that? Okay, let's start with what that is, you know? And so you can't tell me that you can't find anybody if you haven't gone and talked to black colleges and universities, you know? And so it, it is up to us to educate ourselves and learn and try some things. And this is very grassroots. I mean, some of the companies that I've talked to that have had great success with hiring diverse talents have gone to the schools, OK, because schools today are very diverse and gone to the guidance counselors and the teachers and said, who do you have that's graduating in May that we could talk to? And they're having those conversations in March. You know, OK, you've got some you got you got a class of 500 kids that are going to go into the workforce in, uh, you know, in, in two months. 
Why not have them work for us? We have internships. We have programs for, you know, for entry level people that we would love to talk to some people. Give us your best and brightest. I mean, that kind of thing is is um, is widely accepted. So uh, that's tokenism. OK, so just don't do it and work hard to prevent tokenism from starting. OK, so it's I mean, like once it's tokenism, it's too late. Right. You've done the wrong thing. Um and then I'm so sorry. What was the second part of your question? No, we, we, so we talked about tokenism. Then we talked about just bias, you know, in, oh, in bias. the process. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about bias is we all have it. I, I, I think it's really important that your, your audience know that bias is not a dirty word. Um, a lot of people are confused about what bias means and they equate it with prejudice. And I blame the media for that because I think the media has sort of conflated prejudice and, and bias and they think bias means hate. It doesn't mean that. It means preference. So a, a great neutral example that I can give you is I have a lot of friends who have kids and they'll say things like, you know, all the kids on my kid's soccer team are terrific, but forgive me, I'm a little biased toward my own child. OK, so that parent is not saying I hate the other kids on the team. They're saying I have preference for my own kid and preference is normal. OK, like as a human species, we have survived living in tribal and primitive you know, communities by being around people who were like us, okay? Because that meant safety and protection and survival. But what we have to do in business is recognize that bias is always there. And it's not a negative thing, it's just a thing. It's just a thing, but it can have a negative impact on, on business if we don't guard for it. So here's a really disturbing example that's from Yale, a Yale study. This is, this is gonna make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, everyone. So get ready that bias can change our, the way we make decisions in business and not in a good way. And we're not even aware that it's happening. So the study from Yale used a hypothetical example of a hypothetical town that had a hypothetical police department and they had a hypothetical opening for a new police chief. Okay. So that's the hiring thing. They have to hire a new police chief. So they created two equal characters. These are all hypothetical, Michael and Michelle. But because of their names, you can tell their gender, okay? Michael and Michelle. <clears throat> and on paper, Michael and Michelle were identical. It was the exact same resume, okay? The exact same resume with one exception. Michael was presented as having more street smarts. And Michelle was presented as having more formal education, okay? So that's the only difference. I mean, like, the only difference. So the hiring managers in this example chose Michael, okay? And ultimately what we learned is that they had a bias toward a male police chief. Okay. Like, so they're just sort of like in their mind, they're looking at this and they're trying to be, you know, objective or, but they're, they're not even aware of their own bias, but like, you know, okay, this seems like a guy, a job for a guy. Right. So they hire Michael. And when asked afterwards, why did you hire Michael? The evaluator said, well, he had more street smarts and street smarts are really important for a police chief to have. Okay. I'll buy that. That sounds legit, but then here's the kicker. Then they did the exercise again and they switched the resumes. So now Michael has more formal education and Michelle has more street smarts. That's the only difference. They do the whole thing again. And once again, the evaluators chose Michael. And when asked, why did you choose Michael? They said, well, you know, a police chief needs to have formal education. Like that's a really, they switched the criteria, they actually changed the criteria for hiring to hire the person that they wanted to hire all along, probably unconsciously, okay? But nevertheless, that's what they did. So bias can be really destructive at work. It, it can lead to decisions like that. It can lead to promoting the wrong person just because you like them or prefer them or they're like you or you're more comfortable with them. It can even lead to studies show, it can even lead to siding with people in meetings. Like, so let's say there's a conversation and there's different points of view or whatever, but I like you, Jim. So I side with you, even if that makes no sense. Right. I mean, like, it's just like, what does that have to do with Jim? Nothing. It's a business decision, you know, but so that's why we have to work against bias. And it's a difficult thing to do because it's in us. It's in us. It's a, it's part of, you know, it's, it's part of the, being a human being. There's a difference between bias and prejudice. Bias is normal and it's in us. Prejudice is an action. Mm. When you're prejudiced, that shows up in actions. You discriminate against people. You berate people. I mean, like there's a, an action that follows prejudice. Bias has consequences in business if we're not watching out for those but it doesn't mean you're prejudiced and it doesn't mean that you hate people. It means that you default 
to a certain type of person because you prefer them, which does also not mean that you have a negative impression of everybody else. It just means that you have a positive impression of that one person. So in this example, the, the, the hiring example, the evaluators did not have a negative impression of Michelle. They just had a more positive impression of Michael. Well, this has definitely absolutely been a wealth of information. <laughs> uh, and uh, okay, so for me, I'm, and we've I'm, covered the book. <laughs> well, okay, so but for me, you know, we we looking at you know your 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 origin story, um, yeah. You know, and and looking at you know you've written several books, you you know sought out speaker in this particular topic, um, have a an immense amount of domain expertise. I start thinking about. You know, well, what, what about you in regards to some of the goals that you may have? Is there a one goal that you can share with us? A goal, a business goal or a life goal? Or I don't want to frame, I don't want to frame you. Okay. Um, well, one goal that I have right now is I'm learning to play the cello <laughs> and I really suck at it. Okay. <laughs> so it's a very difficult instrument to earn, to learn, but I also, you know, I travel a lot, so I can't take it with me when I travel. And so I'm not making excuses. My, just my reality is I can't practice for an hour a day because if I'm on the road for four days a week, there's four days where I can't, you know, so a goal that I have is to become what I would call proficient at cello. I do not expect to be in a symphony. I am playing purely for my own enjoyment and my own pleasure, but I, I would like to at least be proficient and not suck because right now I suck. Okay. So that's a goal that I have. And I've only been taking cello lessons for about three months. Okay. So I'm really, you know, really a beginner. Um, Another business goal, a business goal that I have is to, to make a real difference in the world. I'm not sure how I'm going to quantify that Jim, to be honest, you know, I talk about goals and like setting goals. Well, then how do you know you get there? I'm like, this is kind of a nebulous one, but um, to make a real difference in how people feel about DE&I and that they don't have to be as scared of it as they are right now. And I think I'm making progress in that vein because I stay very, very booked as a speaker on this topic for all different kinds of organizations. And that tells me that there is a crying need uh, and a desire among people to do better and be better. They just don't know how. So I, one of my goals is to just show them some simple tools and things to say, things not to say, whatever, that can actually make their lives easier and still make progress on DEI. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. All right, now here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Kelly. Kelly, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Okay. Kelly McDonald, are you ready to hoedown? I'm ready to hoe down. All right. So what (laughs) is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Um, What's holding me back is self-care. I I tend to run at afterburners on all the time. And I find that I am, uh, that that I often feel the effects of that in my self-care. I'm often extremely tired and that no amount of sleep will actually, you know, fix that or whatever. And that I, um, that I tend to have an inability to say no to things. And so that's what holds me back is I, what my, my, my goal is, is to do what I call bigger, better, fewer. And I think that's a good life goal for anybody with anything is I would rather do fewer things that matter more and do them well than to say yes to everything that comes across my plate. And I burn myself out. So that's a goal that I'm working on. I've been working on it for a while. It's hard. And what is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Lead by example. And what do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Listening to different perspectives. When I talk to people who have different perspectives, it's not only eye-opening, sometimes it's uncomfortable, sometimes it's uh, the smartest thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, but just really being open to what other people say and what their perspectives are and the insights that they have to offer. And what would be one book you'd recommend to the Fast Leader Legion? And it could be from any genre. I would recommend Innovation is Everybody's Business by Tamara Gondor. Um, And let me spell the last name. It's G-H-A-N-D-O-U-R. One of the things I like about that book is that a lot of people think the word innovation is very lofty. And you're like, you have to be sitting there, you know, in some white ivory tower, you know, like with all the brainiacs in the world being innovative. And um, her perspective is that, 
it's not somebody else's department to be innovative and innovation is everybody's business. And if you're a junior person, you know, at a, at a company or a senior person, or whatever, if you have an idea on how to make something better, faster, more efficient, whatever it is, you can really play a role in everyday innovation. It doesn't have to be creating rocket science. It can just be the smallest little things that make a business <clears throat> or a group or a team better, faster. So I really encourage that book. It's also a fast read. It's like a hundred pages paperback. And so it's called Innovation is Everybody's Business. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net and doing a search for Kelly McDonald. Okay, Kelly, this is my last hump day hold on question. Imagine you've been given the opportunity to take the knowledge and skills you have now back to the age of 25. Okay, but you can't take it all. You can only choose one. So what skill or knowledge would you take back with you and why? I would tell my younger self or the skill I would take back is pace yourself, um, <clears throat> that it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so like a lot of um, <clears throat> ambitious people who, you know, love, who love what they do, I have historically said yes to everything that comes along and whether just I've said yes to everything. In fact, that was my mantra is how do we get to yes? For the longest time, my mantra was how do we get to yes? And what I learned is um, sometimes it's okay to say no. And sometimes the very best thing that you can do is say no. And the quick example I'll give is in 2013, I do about 75 speaking engagements a year. And that's a really good number for me. I'm on the road a lot, but I'm not fried. In 2013, I did 100 speaking engagements, okay? And like, weirdly, I didn't plan that. It didn't, it just turned out to be 100, not 101 or 199. And I was gone for 200 plus days in that year. And in March of 2013, I had 19 speaking engagements in 19 cities in 19 days. And that will mess you up, you know? And no, it just really will. It'll, it just... And yeah, I mean, I was, I had a good month, let's put it that way, but I just, it, it came at great price. And one of the things that I've learned as I've gotten older is you can't get that time back. You can't get those moments back. Uh, even in your personal life, when I say yes to everything, my friends um, suffer, my, you know, my, my relationship with my friends, they quit calling because they know you're not around, you know, and they, and they start doing the whole like, well, tell us when you are in town and we can go to happy hour. You know, because so I think I would like tell my younger self that pace yourself. It's it's a marathon, not a sprint and um, bigger, better, fewer, you know. Kelly, uh, thanks for being here today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Sure. Um, I'm everywhere. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on social media, all those social media platforms. My website is mcdonaldmarketing.com and that's M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D, just like you see on your book title there, Jim, in the background. Um, I do a lot on LinkedIn. If you want to LinkedIn me, I'm, you know, Kelly C. McDonald on LinkedIn. And you can put in Kelly McDonald Denver and I'll come right up and you'll see all my posts. And uh, you can email me at Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at McDonaldMarketing.com. And uh, you can go to my website and you can find all my contact information. You can call us. You know, I mean, like, I'm pretty accessible. Um, I don't have like a huge team of people that are blocking me from people. You know, it's like, I like to talk to everybody. Kelly McDonald, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and helping us all get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 